Hello, welcome everybody. Um, so uh, here we are. It's the IMAP specialist series. Uh, let's talk asset allocation. So our session today is the first of two sessions and uh, we're looking at asset allocation, the current state of play. My name's Jerome Lander. I'm, um, I'm Chief Investment Officer at Wealthlander and also Portfolio Manager at Dynamic Asset. And today, uh, our panelists are uh, Richard Rauch of First Century Investors. Now, Richard is just um, on my left here. He's the Investment Director for Multi-Asset Solutions and uh, works very closely with clients for providing investment solutions across asset allocations and uh, is mixed in with the investment teams there. So an investment specialist. And uh, further to my left, we have Michael Karagiannis, who's from Jana. And uh, Michael's a senior consultant at Jana, responsible for retail partnerships. So what's today about? What have you tuned in for? Well, um, the, the two, uh, Richard and Michael, are going to basically talk for about 12 minutes each. And um, I'm going to tell you in a second what they're going to talk about. And um, then we're going to ask questions. And I'll come to that in terms of how you ask questions as well. And we'll have a question and answer session. And so today will be somewhere between 45 and minutes and an hour long. Uh, Richard will start by talking about why multi-asset class investing and what is the most important decision an investor will make. It is indeed an active decision. He'll also talk to, while much remains about strategic asset allocation, strategic asset allocation is moving to dynamic asset allocation and to a goals-based approach, and why. Um, he'll critique the simple 60-40 balance fund and talk about why it's unlikely to deliver like it has for the past 40 years. And it also concentrate on defensive assets, which is a big area of interest, obviously, for a lot of people, um, and how we're responding to obvious challenges here with bonds and cash. What are the alternatives? And how is inflation relevant? Next, we'll move to Michael. And Michael will talk about how Jana has changed its asset allocation over time in response to the challenges what's changed with respect to the growth focus. So unlike Richard, he'll focus a bit more on the growth part of the portfolio. He'll talk to also about the differences between wholesale and retail client portfolios and the opportunity set they face. And he'll also um, highlight to us um, Jana's capital market assumptions, which I'm sure will be of interest to people and the challenges and opportunities this poses moving forward. So, um, how do you ask questions? Well, um, you'll see on this slide that if you go to um, the bottom of your screen, there's a question answer thing. Uh, not, not there, though, if you actually just uh, press on that, you'll be able to type in your question and I'll be able to see them and uh, we'll be able to ask uh, those questions or at least uh, 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 depending on how many we get, um, uh, some of them to, to our panelists and, and discuss them in the uh, question and answer and discussion session. Right, so without further ado, on to, uh, on to Richard. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Jerome. Um, happy Monday, everyone. Uh, so moving on, um, as you can see in the slides. Um, so asset allocation. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite Yogi Berra quotes. Uh, the future ain't what it used to be. Um, and although I have an American accent, I do live in Australia. I've been here for over a decade. Um, uh, so in terms of multi-asset investing, I think my argument here is that we're at a bit of a crossroads. Um, my focus and I think my expertise has always fallen on the defensive side of the ledger. Uh, so fixed income, fixed interest, cash, moving into credit. We'll get into credit a little bit later. Um, but maybe it's important to start with why uh, people have fixed income in their asset allocation to begin with. Um, and in, in part why an SAA sort of traditional 60-40 balance fund has done so well uh, in the past, I don't know, 30 or 40 years. Um, for three reasons, you own fixed income. For income, for defensiveness, and for liquidity. Uh, you probably come up with a few others, but those are the key ones. We looked at the data over the last 40 years, uh, really when these strategies, a traditional balance fund became popular um, between 30 and 40 years ago. And the reason they've done so well, um, let me just give you a couple stats. Over that 40 year period in the US, equity returns were like the S&P 500 would have delivered around 9% in 
annualized, give or take, uh, depending on which index you're looking at or sub-index. More interesting, I think, and, and part of the reason why uh, a balanced fund is delivered so well is that bonds, uh, US aggregate, just a general passive exposure to fixed income would have delivered 8% annualized over those 40 years. And that's with about a third or a quarter of the volatility um, of the equity market. Um, suffice to say, we don't think that's going to happen uh, in the period ahead. Um, the other thing uh, that's important to point out is correlation. I think conventional wisdom in asset allocation is that bonds and equities are negatively correlated, um, meaning if stocks go up, bonds go down, and when bonds go up, stocks go down, and they're a hedge for each other. Um, it helps you hold on to those risky assets during the scariest moments which I guess prevents you from the cardinal sin of investing, which is selling at the bottom, right? Um, so that correlation uh, stability, um, we think it's stable, but it actually isn't if you look over time, um, depending on how far back you go. Now, encouragingly, it has been stable during times of crisis, uh, GFC.com bust, you know, even March of 2020, um, you know, we did see fixed income perform and be quite defensive. Um, so we'll get back to that in a second. And then finally, liquidity. We'll cover liquidity, but suffice to say, uh, really the only game in town, frankly, is cash uh, if you want true liquidity. Um, the other point I want to make around asset allocation um, is that it's an active decision. So I, I, I like to joke with people that, you know, when a child is born into this world, you give them a name, uh, you give them a birth certificate, you cut their umbilical cord, and you give them an asset allocation. Um, that... Uh, you know, and it might be a 60-40 or an 80-20 or 70-30. Um, and you open up an envelope 60 years later and you have this massive amount of money and a smile on your face. Um, you know, if you have that long a time horizon, perhaps that is the right approach. Um, but one of my arguments here is that people's time horizon often is shorter than they think. Um, and this is both on the institutional and the retail side. Institutions, they change boards, they change management. Um, they change, you know, the underlying constituents who are in there. Um, on the retail side, you, you know, someone might have a divorce or they might, you know, uh, get an illness or a family member might get an illness. And so that kind of 20, 30, 40, 50 year long term time horizon might only be five or 10. And I guess given what's gone on at the defensive side um, of the ledger, that creates all sorts of problems. Um, so. Finally, on this slide, what we have here, uh, it, it's a snapshot on valuations. Um, so using the left-hand uh, guide on equities, this is the Schiller PE or the CAPE uh, price earnings ratio in the US, the, the cyclical adjusted price earnings ratio. Um, and that is at pretty much the highest level it's ever been with the exception of the dot-com bust in 2000. Um, and then we have fixed income, which everyone I think knows, but that little blip uh, at the bottom uh, with rates going up is what's caused all this panic. Uh, but you can see 1.6%, which actually is lower than the inflation rate um, at the moment. Um, so we have a valuation problem. The starting point does matter. And then we have a time horizon, potential time horizon problem, which I just outlined. So I guess what are you recommending? In a nutshell, mm -hmm. I think we're seeing most clients focus on goals-based or objective-based investing. Um, that's not throwing away the SAA approach. It just means you need to be a bit smarter about figuring out what your actual true assets are and your true liabilities are to deliver um, on the overall portfolio going forward. So the next slide, um, is cash still king? Right. So this is a long-term chart going back to the early 90s of the cash rate in Australia. Uh, and, um, you know, you can see all the seminal moments uh, over time. We're now down to an all-time record of 0.1% uh, or 10 basis points. Um, so cash used to be great as part of this barbell strategy in Australia. It's like you have your property, you have a few equities, and you've got your cash. That's kind of all you needed, and it worked really well. Um, you had liquidity, you had defensiveness, you were getting really good returns. When I uh, came to Australia about a decade ago, I was getting a bank account at about 7.5%. So I was happy to leave, um, leave money invested there. Um, so uh, one thing to point out about the cash rate um, and first cent year, we, we pretty much the largest cash manager in Australia. 
the cash rate at target at 0.1% is actually quite a bit higher than what you can get in the market in the actual cash market. Um, a major bank uh, NCD, negotiable certificate of deposit, is trading around three basis points, maybe four. Um, and for most of last year, it was around one. Um, and so the other thing to point out is in February of 2021, although fixed income sold off quite a bit, and we'll get to that in a second, um, cash markets actually printed their first negative return ever. Um, and this was the index. This was the Bloomberg, Osborne, Bank Bill Index. It was tiny negative, um, but the short end moves um, created a negative. We all know that as yields go up, prices go down and, and reverse. Um, and so that was, um, that was something I think surprised a lot of um, our clients, whether they be institutions or, or retail investors. Um, so you have to do something if you want to generate more return, or it's really an expectations management exercise, which I think uh, we'll get to in a minute. Um, but as it relates to liquidity, our key point is that cash still is the only game in town. Um, we would caution investors from moving out the credit spectrum in their cash allocation, um, although there are ways you can do it in a relatively smart way. Um, moving on uh, to fixed income on the next slide. And so what we have here uh, are Australian 10-year, five-year, and three-year bond yields over time, over the last couple of years. Um, of course, if we went back even further, it would look like they basically have done nothing but go down, but we've zoomed in here uh, to see what happened uh, more recently. Uh, but bond investors, a lot of uh, market kind of uh, prognosticators have been talking about this like rise in bond yields for you know at least a decade since the GFC um, and how that's going to destroy your returns um, and, and generate negative returns in a portfolio. Um, that is true. If rates go up, you will get a mark to market negative. And that's exactly what we saw um, in February of this year. The Yellow Bond Composite Index, which most people use as their fixed income allocation here in Australia, or, or at least part. Uh, it was down about 4%, 3.5%, 4% uh, just on that month alone. So if we saw another rise of, I don't know, uh, nearly 100 basis points since the end of 2020, uh, we'd probably see a bigger negative return in that part of the portfolio. Um, so my point here is that the boy is constantly crying wolf around negative interest or interest rates are going up. Um, interest rates are going up for a small part of time. We had negative interest rates on the horizon. Um, but at some point, we think they're likely will go up. It's just a matter of when. Um, and in that interim period, it's going to be kind of painful. Um, so the next uh, slide is basically a um, breakdown of some of the common bond indices their duration profile, so interest rate risk. Um, I like to say that uh, it's kind of like volatility. When people say the word volatility, they really mean markets are going down. Um, when they, you know, that you can have upside volatility, you can go sideways and be volatile. Um, so uh, interest rate risk actually need not be a bad thing. It actually helps you out during times of crisis. Um, you could see uh, on the chart here that um, the durations are quite long of the major markets and the market cap indices around the world. Um, many of the key ones have like doubled in the last 10 or 15 years, which means for every unit of fixed income you own, you probably have twice as much interest, interest rate risk as you used to. Uh, and you can see in a month, if you own just broad based, uh, you know, US treasury or Aussie treasury exposure, um, if interest rates go up hundred basis points, um, your, your portfolio, your fixed income portfolio will be down nearly 7%. And then finally, just to wrap it up, um, inflation. So this is uh, on everybody's mind at the moment. I mean, as a bond investor and bond investors, uh, this is something we obsess about uh, because, you know, bonds generally have fixed coupons and inflation is quite bad uh, for your return, uh, if you're, your real return, if you're a bond holder. Um, the question is not, are we having inflation or is there additional inflation in the market right now. Uh, the question is, is it transitory? Uh, meaning, and that this is the Fed's language, the RBA's language and others, they're saying that, yeah, we think inflation is going to go up the next several months. Um, but as we move into later in the year, it's really going to settle back down to a normal level. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have actual Australian inflation 
And we like to look at one of the series that pulls out some of the noisier components. You can see we're well below the RBA band of two to 3%. Um, so they've been failing on that for some time. And on the right hand side, we often get asked, what about market implied inflation? Um, two measures we look at the US break even inflation rate, which is really the difference between nominal and inflation linked bonds and the five-year, five-year forward inflation rate, which basically says, what do people think inflation is going to be five years from now for the next five years? Um, it's higher than it was last year, um, but by no means kind of going off the charts. I think our general view is that, yeah, we think it is mostly transitory, mostly uh, often supply driven, uh, but really the data is something everyone needs to keep track of and building some inflation protection in your portfolio right now probably makes sense. Thanks, Richard. So, pass it on to um, to Michael. No, thank you uh, very much, uh, and um, thank you, Richard, for your, your comments. Uh, I'm going to give Jana Investment Advisors perspective um, on uh, asset allocation. I'm going to start with uh, what our asset class views are, and I'm going to contrast the long-term expectations, more normal type. Uh, expectations of asset classes, and then talk about the issues over the medium term, given where we see asset classes at this point in time. So building in that valuation dynamic, which Richard talked about. Some of the things we're going to be in vehement agreement about, and some things we might uh, have a bit of a disagreement about, but that makes for an interesting webinar. Um, firstly, uh, in terms of looking at asset classes, I've taken a snapshot of asset classes here and put two bars in. Um, the orange bar really shows the long-term expectation that we have for various asset classes. It's a more normal look at asset classes, assuming less distortion to current valuations. And you can see there on the left-hand side, you've got your fixed income assets, you move towards your uh, growth assets as you move towards the middle. And then on the right-hand side, you've got asset classes that are perhaps uh, more uh, uh, quirky um, infrastructure. Um, they're perhaps uh, less available to uh, retail uh, investors such as private equity. Um, but you tend to find that there's some very good risk return trade-offs, what we would generally you know, pull into the alternatives bucket. Um, the blue line is interesting because it shows the medium term outlook for these asset classes on an annualized return basis. And you can see there, that for a lot of the asset classes in the first two thirds of this chart, a material reduction in expected return on an annual basis. And it's across the asset class spectrum uh, generally. So uh, you see it most noticeably with cash, picking up the point that Richard made that cash is offering virtually nothing at this point in time, I guess a long-term expectation of around 3% or thereabouts. Uh, but fixed income generally is quite problematic because of the collapse in interest rates. And you see that on the left-hand side of the chart. As soon as you move into the middle section, you can see that it is also a story that is replicated for growth assets. So whether you're talking about Australian equities, global equities, emerging markets, all these asset classes are, in our view, less uh, likely to deliver the sort of returns that we would expect over the long term because of the starting point we see in terms of valuation. Very elongated, elevated PEs um, coming out of a, a, a strong recovery in earnings at this point in time that tends to suggest to us that the expectation on a forward looking basis is somewhat uh, diminished. You move to the right hand side of the chart, however, and some of these other asset classes are actually looking as, you know, pretty much in line with their long term expectations, in some cases actually enhanced. So infrastructure, property, uh, private equity, in some cases, it's because they just have not recovered to the same extent as we've seen traditional asset classes in this post COVID period. That's certainly true for property and infrastructure. In other cases, such as private equity, they weren't as materially affected. That's that mark to market effect, that less volatility in that space. And we see the forward looking expectations, they're still quite reasonable. So this is really important in terms of framing asset allocation uh, at this point in time. And when you go to the next chart and you actually look at various risk profiles, when you bring these asset classes together. So what we're assuming here um, is a, an expectation about various uh, risk strategies on the left-hand side, a very high risk strategy, a 90-10. Uh, you can see there the impact of this reduction in expected return across the asset class spectrum for a pretty vanilla type of 90-10 portfolio would represent about a 1.5% annualized reduction in expected return. And as you step through becoming less risky, a 50-50 portfolio, for example, more moderate risk, 
uh, you're looking at the reduction being, uh, you know, closer to 2%. Um, and then for a conservative portfolio, taking on board the point that Richard made about the collapse in interest rates, um, you're seeing, you know, quite a material reduction. It's a full 2% per annum. Inflation expectations have not reduced as much. Um, and so what this means is that for any risk profile, uh, if you just look at the expected return on a pretty much a passive asset allocation structure, an SAA-based approach, looking at passive asset class exposures, maybe through ETFs, um, then it's going to be much more difficult to achieve a certain CPI plus type return that we might traditionally have expected and certainly what we've received over the last few years. Well, Michael, could I just interrupt you yeah. there for a second? Because I had a few questions about this. Yep. Can you just outline um, whether these returns are total returns you're talking about, including yep. dividends and what medium term means for so you these, versus long term? Yeah, so these incorporate uh, dividend expectations. So it's total all in return, it, assuming zero taxation. So obviously people's taxation expectation uh, is material, but it is constant for short and long term. Uh, it assumes just an investment in the asset class. It doesn't assume any active management. Yeah. Um, it assumes no fees, however. Um, so what we're basically looking at is if you could go and build on your own uh, merits, uh, a passive portfolio based around ETFs, for example, with very little fractional cost, this is the type of long-term expectation you would expect with the blue line uh, on this page and on the orange line, uh, it would be the medium term assumption. The difference between those two Time frame, one of time frame, but importantly, it's the starting point. Uh, medium term assumes that we start here and now with current valuations and that there is a long process to recovery to normalize uh, valuations in markets. And of course, what that means is coming from a very overvalued expectation for bonds and equities, the returns are very severely diminished. The longer term expectation is close to an e equilibrium assumption that you know, we're ignoring the, the shorter term noise from markets. We're really trying to focus on the 10, 10 plus year type time frame, And that's great in the long term, but it doesn't necessarily guide us in terms of what markets can generally throw off for a portfolio over the next three to five years, for example. So that's, that's a critical difference mm -hmm. um, and informs how you go about building portfolios. And I guess you know, one, some things that come out of this, um, you know, does show that, um, people have to be much more conservative about their expectations about what portfolios can generate. A 60-40 portfolio or 50-50 portfolio or a 90-10 portfolio, what it's delivered in the past is not going to be what it's going to deliver in the future. Yep. It's going to be severely diminished. In many cases, people have CPI plus expectations that are attached to certain risk profiles. They need to revisit those. And I'll show you some probability analysis but we see with a lot of our clients actually reducing the target expectation for portfolios now because of this paradigm that we're focusing on. The probabilities aren't going to be robust enough for them to deliver what they have on the tin at this at this point. Right. And just one other question, sorry to yeah. interrupt again, just a couple of questions on this as well. Just the 90, 10 and 70, 30 portfolios having the same expected Yeah, it's returns. a really interesting point because you know what that, one possible response to this environment is of course, we'll just take more risk. But what this shows is that actually, as you move up the risk spectrum, there is a point at which you're adding risk to the portfolio. You're not actually adding return expectation. The return profile actually starts to flatten off because of the impact of that uh, diminution of expected return for growth assets. And so that's not necessarily the panacea here. So in our view, what people do have to think about is what is a reasonable mix between risk and return? What can you reasonably expect a high growth portfolio to throw off? Do we need to actually dial back the return expectations, particularly if they're expressed in a CPI plus four? But, and what other asset classes can we bring to the table? This is looking at a very much a traditional um, growth asset, defensive asset mix, but there are other asset classes, particularly on that first chart I showed that sit outside of that universe that perhaps can add a third dimension to this conversation. Asset classes like private equity, where the, the risk return impact actually could be more positive and more beneficial to a portfolio. But we've got to think more laterally about how we construct portfolios for this environment. It's not going to turn the dial back because equity beta is so pervasive, but it is actually going to add some enhancement. And I think also active management. Uh, there is a view in this environment that you actually dial down active management because if the returns are going to be diminished, then let's not spend too much on fees. 
But the counter argument to that is you actually need as much alpha as you can get. And maybe alpha is more important in this environment. You just got to make sure that the alpha you're spending your money on is actually delivering and is worthwhile. Um, in the interest of time, uh, this is just uh, looking at some portfolios that we manage on behalf of a client. A lot of numbers on this chart, but uh, looking at the investment objectives, these are not by any means outlandish investment objectives. You will see them quite commonly out in the market. They have actually been reduced for this set of portfolios uh, over the course of the last year already. So we're looking at a moderate portfolio, 50-50 type portfolio, CPI plus 2% a growth portfolio throwing off maybe a CPI plus four. These are not unreasonable expectations. But if you look down the page and the third row across from the bottom, the probability of meeting the return objective over the entire investment horizon, you'll see that they're all less than 50%, a materially less than 50%. What that's saying is that either something's got to change in these portfolios, or it could be that these return expectations are still too high albeit that they're not particularly aggressive in a market context. I can show you, you know, other investors that have got materially high expectations that have not been revisited for quite some period of time. They're not going to achieve them in our view on a forward looking basis. That is a, a critical problem for the industry at the moment. Um, just finishing off in terms of our asset class expectations and what falls out of this analysis, um, it's hard to come across asset classes that are outright cheap at this point in time. Easy money has really, you know, a rising tide has lifted all asset class boats. Um, but asset classes that do stand out are perhaps relatively more attractive, either for risk or return reasons. Infrastructure, um, particularly, you know, perhaps providing another dimension in terms of an inflation hedge. Private equity, as I showed you on that previous chart, it's one asset class that has not been as affected by this valuation paradigm uh, and hedge funds. Now that's a, a very broad uh, analysis there, but hedge funds that can provide genuine risk reduction characteristics with an overall portfolio. Credit um, is something that perhaps we disagree a little bit here, but our preference is probably for credit in uh, preference to cash. Uh, we see cash at the moment, uh, while it's very defensive, it is not returning anything. Um, and the more cash you hold within a portfolio, the more pressure it is providing on other parts of the portfolio. So credit fits within that middle risk component of the portfolio. People will incorrectly label it defensive and hence get caught out when we go through a market correction uh, because it doesn't behave the same way as government debt, um, but it does provide yield enhancement, particularly in this environment, and it's not as risky as equity market exposure. And that's something that we do think is worthwhile. But everything on the right hand side is quite problematic and in our view it's something that you want to hold to varying degrees underweight within portfolios at this point in time um, so you know largely the the challenges are how to build portfolios in an environment where all asset classes uh, provide some challenges there are some better than others um, that people are probably going to be caught out because portfolios are not going to deliver the sort of returns that we've seen Historically, I think that's a common theme with Richard in that regard. Having to look more further afield in terms of exploring asset classes that perhaps traditionally have not been incorporated within portfolios, you haven't needed to look at them either from a return or a risk perspective. Um, and also perhaps being much more cautious about the expectations you're engendering with your clients as to what a particular type of portfolio structure and its risk profile will be able to conceivably deliver in terms of return moving forward. Terrific. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, well, look, um, we're going to move to some um, some questions now. Um, and um, basically, um, uh, we're going to. So, so, if you do have some questions, please put them through. We've got a, we've got a few already. Um, so, look, that's been. A good outline of some of the challenges we face and look i think it's probably quite a bit shock it's probably a bit shocking to people because obviously you know returns have been generally very good so people haven't necessarily felt the need to change but of course you know invest investment specialists all over the industry are saying well hang on a second we know this can't continue forever and there's going to be prospectively we we have a huge problem now that um, cash rates and bond rates are where they are and and equities are expensive and all the rest of it and so i guess, I guess the first question to ask is um you know do, do people really are really are people really taking this on board yet in the industry? Are they actually adjusting the way they're doing asset allocation and 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 the way they're they're treating portfolios, or or are they or are they or are they simply just saying look we'll just we'll just 
I mean, one of my perspectives is people just seem to have ramped more into equities. They've said, oh, look, we hate cash and bonds. We'll just put more into risk assets in order to try and meet our returns by taking more risk um, uh, and, and hope that works. They're gambling a bit more, arguably. But what are you guys seeing? How are you? How are people responding to these these challenges, which have been you know being talked about a lot uh, in recent times, and are obviously very real, explainable challenges that we're going to face going forward? So uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll kick it off. I'll, I'll give you a definitive: uh, Are people responding? A definitive sort of um, to that uh, question. Um, it depends on the client uh, largely, um, but w sadly, what we see often uh, is that people look in the rearview mirror um, and look at the returns that have been generated in the last year or two and extrapolate that out. And until, like, you see the whites of their eyes, so to speak, until, um, you know, it wasn't until the very end of this past year and this first quarter, people realized their cash allocations were basically zero. Because in many money market funds, you're kind of getting, you know, you're getting old rates terming off. You're getting people who had term deposits that were still in place with nice kind of juicy, relatively speaking, rates. Um, and so now that, you know, I think it's dawned on um, many people. Also, central banks have been quite clear, um, the RBA for sure, um, that they're going to be keeping rates here. Uh, this will be interesting to see how it plays out for like three more years or four more years. And, and so I think that messaging, which has been very consistent and the Fed uh, just came out and that, you know, they re reiterated that, um, you know, I think most investors are hearing that and saying, okay, well, if this exists, this environment exists for the next three years, four years, five years, I have to do something. Mm -hmm. So we are beginning to see uh, movement. Mm -hmm. Now, as it relates to moving into something that's more like goals based into from like an old 6040, uh, we are seeing a bit of action there. Um, I think partly because I think we're seeing more of an institutionalization of the wholesale market to a degree where you have you know, really experienced um, asset allocators who are making a lot of these decisions in their model portfolios, right? And and they, you know, they think from a goals-based perspective, right? Mm -hmm. um, one point, which I might get to later, is that I, I think one of the issues is people don't always, including institutions, look at a sum of all of their assets, um, meaning, you know, let's say they have an investment property or they have you know, a, a pension in some other location. They don't add that to their entire portfolio and look at it kind of holistically. And same thing on the liability side. They're like, wait a minute, I didn't realize I was gonna have to pay up for all these expenses, um, you know, when I get to retirement. Um, and so as a result, I think kind of a lot of our kind of institutional uh, clients are making moves, but it's been slower than you would think. I think, I think you made a great point before that, you know, every decision is an active decision. So even if you sit the way you are, there's no real true passive portfolio. It's a, it involves some sort of decision to do something, to, to have any alloc allocation, right? Yeah. And, just, you are, and that's got an implied, there's an implied result of that in that. And just to add to that point, I mean, one example we like to use is, you know, Warren Buffett famously says that, you know, when he passes away, um, you know, his wife is going to inherit uh, his fortune, basically, and... Basically, it's going to be all in uh, 95% in S&P 500 index funds and 5% in cash. It's like, okay, well, that's his asset allocation. His, his, his wife should be very insulted. He doesn't break <laughs> her asset allocation skills right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, but the, the difference here yeah, yeah. is that 5% of billions of dollars it's is a lot, still a lot of money. A lot, and, yeah. and so this is the issue, but that's an asset allocation. Um, your average kind of punter who has you know, has a bit of cash, has a bit of crypto, has a bit of, I don't know, property on the side, guess what? That's an asset allocation. And so Michael, what are you seeing? I mean, you've got obviously, obviously one of the things you could comment on is, are you seeing much difference between, you, know, you mentioned the pressure on saying, well, we've got to reduce fees from coming from the institutional side, in particular, I imagine, and keeping more passive as a result in a, in the, with the aim of reducing the costs of the portfolio, given the returns are going to be low. But are you seeing much difference there with 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 wholesale, you know, clients? And um, no, I think I mean, fees are a very important issue. I, I think mm -hmm. that, uh, however, what we're seeing is that um, uh, fund managers are coming to the party, and we're seeing a lot more willingness to rebate 
fees for active management. So, you know, the, the idea that, uh, you know, the only path to uh, uh, fee reduction is through ETFs is not necessarily the case. It's quite stunning actually how uh, the, the level of rebates you can get, particularly in a managed fund, a managed um, fund and a, and a managed uh, account context where you have that wholesale pooling mechanism available to you. Um, but what I will say is, um, you know, there are differences in terms of the accessibility to certain strategies. So you, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, what is the difference between, say, an institutional client and retail in terms of their ability to implement asset allocation? There are a lot of similarities. There are some differences. Uh, managed accounts, I think, is closing the gap in terms of sophistication. So the fact that uh, you've got uh, consultants involved in the process, um, you know, and Generally, they're very experienced, obviously come from diverse backgrounds perhaps, but they're generally very experienced. They bring a level of sophistication and robustness. I think that is improving portfolio uh, solutions um, and the quality of them. And that may not necessarily be evident in a bull market. Hopefully it becomes more evident in markets that become more volatile moving forward. But not all clients are invested in managed accounts at this point. So there is a tendency for clients, uh, individual investors to rush for the nearest thing. It is a gold rush out there. Um, and people are looking at the next best thing. And in many cases, it's a case of trying to, uh, you know, prevent them being their own worst enemy by mm. pursuing, you know, uh, uh, you know, blind alleys and, and potentially, uh, you know, very fraught investments. So I think that's a real consideration. But on, in terms of what's available to uh, retail investors, even through a managed account structure, the, the key problem is, of course, the lack of the ability to invest in illiquid assets. So I talk about private equity as being a particularly interesting asset class infrastructure. The best deals aren't really easily accessible for retail investors mm -hmm. because you have to maintain a semblance of liquidity for a retail investor in many cases. Advisors are compelled to do that. Yeah. Uh, platforms uh, generally have retail uh, strategies that are very liquid. One month liquidity is about the limit that many can take on. Managed accounts are constrained by virtue of their structure in terms of rebalancing. So the ability to have uh, strategies strategies, for example, that lock up for two or three years and you gain a very good illiquidity premium is something that is not really available in the retail space. So there are yeah. problems that do emerge in terms of mapping across strategies. But then what you do is look for replicative strategies. So if you're looking for inflation hedging, what else is out there that has some liquidity uh, that fits you know, the purpose uh, in that regard, but also can provide you with inflation hedging uh, as, a, uh, as a byproduct. I think that's, that's a challenge. So trying to get the same outcome, not necessarily being able to build portfolios exactly the same way. So Michael, have you seen clients, I mean, have you seen your clients move more into equities? That, you know, that question I asked before about, you know, have, have clients simply been taking more risk with their portfolios in order to try and get to their previous return objectives? Or ha have you seen clients becoming more dynamic and more goals based in terms of saying, well, we're prepared to move the asset allocations around more, um, you know, given the involvement of, of consultants and expertise on, with, with that regard? Are you seeing that happening? Or Look, there is a danger, I think, in this environment that um, clients, and when I talk about our clients, it's, it's for example, I work with not-for-profits, I work with advice, private wealth businesses. Um, allowing the exposure to growth assets to creep up. Now, it might happen naturally because you don't correct market movements. And so that exposure to the growth side of the portfolio naturally starts to increase over time and no one blows the whistle on it. Um, or it's a deliberate ploy, you know, responding to this environment where it's, you know, interest rates clearly are not providing the yield in the past, that uh, in future that we've seen in the past, we, we're going to put more into growth assets to try and supplement expected returns. Our job, I guess, is to try and pull that back a little and look at the risk return paradigm. What are the portfolios really designed to achieve, mm -hmm. not just from a return perspective, but also from a risk perspective. If something happened and we did get a market correction, could that portfolio withstand it? Can we risk test that portfolio on an ongoing basis to give them a sense as to what sort of pain would be achieved for themselves and for their clients yeah. and whether they're comfortable with that? And are there better ways of trying to build a portfolio than simply just adding to equity exposure? Yeah. That I think is the biggest conversation that we're having. At well, the look, moment. we have we have a question on that. I mean, in terms of you know the the non-correlated the the alternative assets. So you know, obviously, we said look, defensive assets don't provide the the sort of risk uh, the return outcomes we're expecting. Yes, if you have to be you have to be liquid, you have to be liquid. You have to be truly defensive. You've got to have some cash. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, rather than just pushing more into equities or equity surrogates, I guess including the liquid ones. Um, are you seeing 
you know, what are the options and what, what are reasonable return expectations out of, you know, hedge funds and liquid alternative assets and, and surrogates and so forth? Um, do, do you think that given return objectives are coming down, there's, there's, there's a more of a space, there's more, and there's more room in the portfolios for those sort of options? Yeah, and I think um, we would certainly encourage it. Um, it has to fit within the, the fee envelope. Um, and a lot, a lot of our clients are very sensitive about that. And of course, as soon as you start moving into some of these alternative spaces, the fee structures can be uh, significant and perhaps excessive, um, particularly for retail clients. So it's really a case of what they can afford, what are they prepared to give up. In traditional asset classes, I mean, you can look at uh, equity managers that manage beta risk differently. Um, so you can look at market neutral strategies, you can look at strategies that have average beta that is materially below a conventional type of approach. That's one way of doing it. You can look at uh, fixed income strategies that are more market neutral in orientation, look to play the yield curve, for example, that are not taking the same sort of fixed income beta risk as we might see with other strategies or the duration risk that we're seeing. So short duration type strategies is a way of playing that. So there, there are ways of doing it in the traditional space as well. But looking at the alternative space, as I said, you know, private equity is an area that we do like. There are very few strategies out there that are available that have the liquidity that you can offer to a retail client. But there are some and incorporating them within a portfolio is certainly something that we've recommended. Boosting exposure to infrastructure, listed infrastructure, it's not as direct an investment as uh, direct infrastructure. Clearly, you've got a lot of fees interposed. Um, but you do have the ability to get some sort of inflation hedging. I think the key to it, however, is when you go down this path, be very clear what is the purpose of introducing that strategy into the portfolio. Is it for return enhancement? Fine, be very clear about that. Is it for risk reduction? And if it's for risk reduction, it may be that it's not going to throw off returns in the short term that meet your expectations, but it's there for a rainy day. It's there for as a disaster insurance type investment within a portfolio. Be very clear about that. And I think sometimes we see portfolios built where clients don't necessarily have a very clear view as to what the role is of each and every component part. And, and yeah, maybe I could just add on in terms of private debt is an area that's getting a lot of attention. And I might just plug, we've launched our first ever private debt product. Uh, recently, it actually focuses on sustainable loans uh, in Australia, so like wind farms, solar farms. Um, but the attraction, and we're hoping to bring that to you know wholesale investors over time. Um, the attraction, other than these are good, you know, ESG friendly assets, um, you do get a premium relative to regular credit markets at the expense of liquidity. <laughs> a, a loan is very complicated um, to move back and forth. Um, between different legal entities. Uh, so it is challenging to offer the liquidity, uh, but we're looking for creative ways to do that. The other nice benefit of illiquids or, or um, private debt, private equity is they aren't, aren't marked to market uh, daily. Uh, and so you don't have the same look at my uh, portfolio on a monthly basis and it's not down nearly as much as uh, my listed assets. And like I said, that prevents you from making the cardinal sin of selling, uh, selling things at the wrong time. Now, Richard, um, you talked a bit about, well, I think I think one of the things you might have a view on is, you know, what are the biggest mistakes uh, you think clients are making with respect to their asset allocation framework today? And we'll touch on that. Michael perhaps give his view on that as well. What's the biggest mistake people are making out there today? Yeah, um, there are a couple, but I, and, and I think I, I touched on this um, earlier, but really extrapolating out history uh, to the future. Uh, and I know... Um, I know we do that on really long time horizons. And I think if we're doing long-term expected returns, which, which we do and our multi-asset team does, um, they wouldn't be that far off of Jana's long-term long expected returns. We're kind of all working with the same data, the same economic data, GDP growth, inflation. It's not like we're gonna have a wildly uh, different equilibrium view, probably, um, at least in, in most major markets. I mean, it's important um, to note that, that those, all those views are not, not as high as what a lot of people out there talk about, right? Yeah. They're actually, you know, talking six or 7% from, from growth assets. They're not that high, right? Yeah, yeah. but yeah, so, I, and, and we would agree, um, we would agree with that, but, um, the, the problem is that to get to those long-term, even those levels which are lower than history, um, there's a path to get there, right? And we have different ways of modeling out that path, right? Um, but one way or another, if, if bond yields are gonna go up, 
um, well, they've got to go up, right? There's going to be a period where bonds underperform. Um, you know, if you're in short duration assets, short duration credit, um, as Michael mentioned, you know, you probably insulated somewhat. Uh, and so there are creative ways you kind of can avoid that, uh, you know, that middle period um, where you're going to really get hurt on both sides. I think the scariest point during the COVID crisis um, in March last year was simultaneously for a very short period of time, but bonds and equities were selling off pretty dramatically simultaneously. Yeah. Um, and that's really when the panic, I think, sort of set in. It's like, wait a minute, I'm losing all this money on the growth side, but also on the defensive side, and everything's illiquid at the same time. Um, so yeah, extrapolating out, I think, is the biggest challenge. Um, and how do you convince someone when it's worked for the last 40 years that it might not work in the next five or 10 is challenging. What, what do you think, Michael, in terms of the the biggest, the biggest mistake that clients are making out there with respect to their asset allocation. Um, and it's, yeah, it's probably not universal. I, I think uh, one of the, the things that we look at, and people, people talk about dynamic asset allocation, we're great believers in dynamic asset allocation, but I think people interpret that as making as many asset allocation changes as possible within a portfolio because you'll get some right. Um, our, our observation of that is you get more wrong that the best asset allocation calls are ones that are held with high conviction and are relatively infrequent. And by that, it might be one or two a year that are absolutely significant and value add. They might be for the purpose of reducing risk or boosting returns or a combination thereof. So you're very clear about the purpose of it. But we find that often, um, you know, we get told that we're, we're not dynamic enough. And when we look at you know, what others are doing. It's just a lot of noise within a portfolio, a lot of decisions, almost trying to appear to be active for the sake of active. And we don't mm. think that's necessarily value add. It obviously adds transactional friction to portfolios. But it, if you trace back, you know, the, the positive or negative impact of those decisions, quite often you find that it's, uh, you know, you, you're actually better off not doing anything at all in the first place. So I'd say that that is a significant consideration uh, that we see. Uh, well, people do trying you, to do you have the governance framework? Do you have the right people to, to make those sort of decisions, all yep. that sort of stuff? Or are you just doing stuff without the, and, without and the backing I, behind I, it? Are you making decisions simply mm. because you feel compelled to do something within a portfolio? Mm. Um, and I think that's, uh, I think as, you know, as advisors, we're advisors to advisors, uh, there is a temptation to believe that, you know, we, we should have our hands on every aspect of the portfolio and, and really controlling all aspects of the decision making. A lot of it is actually picking really good managers, allowing them to do their job. Mm. Um, and if you do that, um, you know, that will enhance the asset class returns that you'll get by the natural structure of the asset allocation in your portfolio. Don't try and overachieve by doing too much within a portfolio. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, not, not to step too far into the active passive debate, I'm sure there are a lot of views on this. Uh, it tend, tends to be a somewhat dogmatic uh, topic. Um, I mean, frankly, we do both in my, the areas I look after, we do both. Um, so it, it really depends on a portfolio, but within a, a multi-asset context, if you're going to be more dynamic, um, you, should more, uh, you should be more liquid. And often those liquid exposures tend to be passive baskets. That's kind of how we think about it. And the more inefficient areas, I don't know, like small cap equities or some of the infrastructure um, asset classes or certain parts of credit markets, um, you know, you could spend your active budget there. And so there is a bit of a balance. Um, but active management is fairly cyclical based on the data we look at. Um, there are long periods of time where it does well and long periods of time it doesn't do well. I think at the end of the day, it comes back to the net of fee discussion. And I think, Michael, you make a good point. Like, we are being squeezed on fees. And I think that's not a bad thing in some cases uh, because really the net outcome being delivered to the client. Um, and if we could deliver a, still a positive net outcome after fees, then they're getting good value for that. Yeah, I mean, the industry tends to focus too much on fees and not on net of fees performance, obviously. We're seeing a lot of that being pushed down from the institutional and regulatory I, imperative. I agree, but we have to differentiate. Everyone feels ebullient in an environment where markets have gone up nicely. So yeah. we've got to be careful that we're not awarding fees for beta returns. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, I think, is has been an issue in the industry for a long yeah. period of time. Okay. Um, and so just on the opportunity, the best, that, you know, I think you touched on this where you said, look, and this is one of my things as well, that I think that if you are a wholesale client who doesn't need, you know, daily liquidity, uh, you, you, don't, you, you shouldn't be put into a retail type solution. 
because one of the things I observe being across both sides is that um, the, the, the solutions available to wholesale clients are actually much superior to many of the solutions available to, to retail clients who require daily liquidity. Um, because there's just a broader opportunity set to do all the all of these things with asset allocation, without you know necessarily being going extremely illiquid and, and all that, all the rest of it, but just to um, just just better quality alpha sources uh, for one, a wider wider spread of asset classes. Um, so so that's a very big opportunity to to put clients in the right you know to, to make sure wholesale clients are able to benefit from from you know superior wholesale solutions. Um, but you know what do you guys think in terms of the biggest opportunity to do better? From asset allocation, what is what is it from your point of view? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll start, and and maybe there's some common ground here, maybe not completely, is on credit. Um, so, credit uh, is a very broad church, right? Uh, it goes all the way, you know, down to junk, which you know is the greatest rebranding in history. Now it's high yield, right? Who doesn't like high yield? Um, to you know, almost every part of fixed income that has default risk. Um, could be considered credit to something that's very short dated, super high quality, you know, double A, triple A assets have very remote uh, probability of defaulting. Um, but I, we do like credit. I, it's just a question of which basket and how far out you go. Um, I think one of the challenges right now is you kind of have to go pretty far out um, to get a meaningful um, extra pickup. Um, certainly global assets seem more attractive than Aussie assets, the Aussie banks. They don't want your money. They don't need your money right now. And hence they're dominating uh, in our market and, and hence uh, margins that you can get from short dated credit to medium dated credit to longer dated credit here in Australia are, are somewhat less, uh, quite a bit less than you would have gotten historically. Um, we do like floating rate credit um, because then you could take longer dated holdings, hedging the interest rate risk out. Um, there's also the issue of the zero to three year band of any fixed income instrument right now, particularly in Australia, also in the US and Europe, where it's very flat yield curve, meaning you don't really start getting a bump up and similar on the credit curve side, which we could get into, but not quite to the same extent. Um, you kind of have to get out past three years before you get a meaningful pickup. And then are you prepared uh, for the spread duration that that um, puts into your portfolio? Meaning your spreads blow out, you're going to take a, take a hit. So as long as it's in the right place, we think it's a pretty attractive area. And just in terms of, um, um, we, we've talked about inflation, we've talked about the need for protection in portfolios and necessarily getting more aggressive um, inflation linked bonds. Do you guys have any thoughts on on that? You know, how do we how do we make sure we protect portfolios um, if we're moving away from you know traditional defensive assets, um, cash and bonds and so forth, and, and also protect around this you know major risk of, of of higher interest rates, higher inflation? I mean, what are the things you think people should be considering? Well, I think uh, if so, if the specific risk that we're guarding against is inflation, a breakout of sustained inflation, it's certainly a possible outcome. It's not necessarily clear that that it will be the outcome, but say you wanted to embed that, embed that factor within a portfolio, um, people do need to consider the overall exposure to growth assets. Now that's perhaps seems counterintuitive because we're talking about a risk to interest rates rising, but bond rates have been a major driver, uh, the collapsing bond rates have been a major driver of equity beta. So if you were to assume that there was a breakout of inflation, a rise in yield curves, that would have to be a negative factor for equity markets to consider. So having a firm view as to the appropriate amount of overall risk within a portfolio, perhaps becoming more defensive by nature, and then just a question of where you express that defensiveness. Looking for asset classes that have a direct exposure to rising inflation. So you mentioned inflation-linked bonds, that's one. Infrastructure, you know, where revenue flows are actually directly linked or are indexed to inflationary pressures, that would be potentially a positive within portfolios as well. Within fixed income, be very careful about duration exposure. In that environment, you know, yield curves rise, you know, short rates are going to rise as well, but the capital loss that you will get from longer dated debt is going to be materially greater. And we've seen precursors to that. So be careful about the duration risk that you have within portfolios. Having perhaps more international currency exposure within a portfolio. And again, that seems counterintuitive because the Aussie dollar often does well in a rising economic environment, you know, that cyclicality. But if we get to a point that equity markets actually have a substantial correction, one of the 
great defensive mechanisms within a portfolio is to hold more foreign currency exposure. Global equities unhedged actually do much better in that environment than global equities on a hedge basis. So having that defensiveness within a portfolio as well. Yeah, uh, just to add, I mean, it, it, I think it's quite easy anecdotally to make the case that inflation is spiraling out of control, right? You know, you have the 30% increased in used car sales in the US in a month. Um, you have, I mean, pretty much probably all of everyone on this call, their inflation basket, you know, whatever that is, is probably going up, things they pay for. Um, however, you know, I, I think it's not happening in every sector of the economy. Um, the reco recovery is quite fragile still. Um, both here in the US, it's going to take um, the remainder of the year, if not into next year, um, to recover. Um, and we won't know probably until, uh, you know, later this year, probably September, October, whether this is how transitory a lot of this is. Um, there's been a lot of supply, you know, shocks and all sorts of issues because of COVID. Um, and it shows the frailty of the supply chain generally. But you know, I would caution people to say that, yeah, we're going to have runaway inflation. Bond markets are pretty smart. You know, that's our experience. They are not pricing in runaway inflation. However, they could turn on a dime and, and change that quickly. Uh, the final thing you could put in is commodities. I know this is kind of a, uh, something out of left field, but there are different things we have in our multi-asset portfolios. Um, really as, you know, an inflation hedge, um, whether it be gold or, you know, energy assets um, or other, you know, agriculture commodities that I think are tied and frankly would have performed quite well in the last uh, six months. Okay, so we're winding down towards the end. I've just got a couple of questions here, which I'll probably answer very quickly um, myself. Um, one, one of them is, um, you know, what, what are the better options for wholesale investors? Is it, is it just sort of alternatives? Um, and so one of the points I make around that is that if you think about it from a funds management point of view, um, there's a lot less um, regulatory and compliance angst with starting a wholesale fund than there is with a retail fund. So a lot of people who think they can get enough money to run their alpha strategies and so forth, you know, and don't want to be too big, never make it to retail. So they don't offer a retail investment solution because they don't feel the need to. And so that's, that can be across any asset class. And that's why, that's why the wholesale investors often have um, superior options because some of the better managers just never feel the need to go or don't want to go retail at all. Um, so that, that's an interesting point to consider. Another point here being made is that, um, you know, a lot of platforms and advisors and so forth are, you know, who are thinking about this are trying to ensure their wholesale clients are getting um, access to, to better investment solutions and funds and offerings um, rather than restricting them to all being the same across their practice to, to, to the lowest common denominator. Um, so that's an interesting point that, that someone's made there. Um, I will say one, yeah. of, one of the problems with the licensee framework and the, the APL framework yeah. is that uh, there's a lot of wholesale clients that are treated as retail and it's, it's, it's basically an extra compliance function and, and I understand the basis of that. But what that does is artificially limit what can be put in front of a client, even mm -hmm. if they are technically wholesale, um, because the licensing arrangement does not allow for that type of provision. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, I, I take your point where it is available, we do see it used and we certainly, the majority of our clients are wholesale by nature. They might be fully institutional. They might be, you know, in this mezzanine market. Um, but you, know, you do hear a lot of uh, uh, practices that are just not able to treat clients as truly wholesale. True. Um, and there's certainly something worth looking at. Um, now, just the last question for today, guys, just to put your thinking hats on going forward, we, we have touched on the traditional approach, you know, perhaps not being very suitable um, going forward because of the lower returns, the need to do things, you know, tinker around the edges, do, do things a little bit differently, bring in a wider spread of assets, think about wholesale versus retail, think about liquidity, all these other things. But um, do you think the current paradigm, the current way people are asset as allocating today Will, will remain the same in five or 10 years, or, or do you think it'll be very different in five or 10 years if you have to put, you know, project forward and say, where do you think we're going in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, maybe I'll kick off with that one. Um, and it has to be 30 seconds each. Yes, right? so, um, so, so I, I think people will, by nature of where the return profile is going, are going to be more goals-based. And like I said earlier, it's understanding what your true liabilities are and every decision you make on the asset side ties into those liabilities. Um, they might need help along the way. 
uh, but I think that's the direction we're going to go because the traditional fixed income is traditional 60 40 when we look in the rear view mirror isn't going to be pretty in my view. I think uh, my, my view is that you tend to see evolution rather than revolution unless there is a clear market um, factor that causes a major re review of that. So if we had a collapse in markets, you know, as part of some sort of uh, liquidity exit strategy on the part of central banks, that would certainly trigger a much more radical reappraisal of the approach. But I think that, uh, you know, I differentiate between the philosophy of SAA and, you know, tilting portfolios to the concept of what the SAA actually is. I think that will change over time. But the philosophy of how we go about building portfolios, unless something really radical happens within markets, um, is, I think, just going to evolve over Do you time. think people will incorporate more odds, for example, into their SAA? Yeah, they'll, they'll look for opportunities to incorporate as they come along. I mean, some people might be adding, you know, sort of uh, cryptocurrencies within their portfolios, shock horror at the present time. But uh, the point is, it's still done within a broad asset allocation framework that is, you know, similar to what we can draw a lineage from over the last few years. Terrific. All right. Well, look, I'd, I'd really like to, to thank you guys for um, for giving your time today for, um, for IMAP's first um, first session. And uh, of course, I welcome everyone who's on this call to um, to please um, come back for our second session where we'll go a bit more granular on, on asset allocation. And I thank you for all your questions there. I hope we got to, to most of them. Um, but um, uh, I think the slides will be available. Is that right after this? To, yes, we will be sharing the slides. There was another question on that. So uh, don't panic. You'll get another chance to to look at them. And um, thanks for tuning in. And we look forward to uh, seeing you on Wednesday at uh, 12 o'clock for the next session. Thanks very much with uh, different, different presenters. Thank you, Dan.